Okay. Hello, this is Dr. James Strickler, and this lesson concerns Chapter 15, Reconstruction, in the United States History Textbook, American Yop. The first topic in this chapter is Lincoln's Reconstruction. This refers to the reconstruction of the United States, and particularly the South, in the years after the Civil War. Now, when I say reconstruction, I don't just mean physical reconstruction of things that were burned or broken, but an economic reconstruction of the country and a political reconstruction. This first topic is Lincoln's reconstruction because he had a particular vision of how reconstruction should take place. In his second inaugural address, after he was um, sworn in as president of the United States for a second term after winning the 1864 election, he famously said that we should have malice toward none as we come back together as a country, that we should try to bind up our wounds to have a lasting peace among ourselves. He wanted to forgive the South and welcome them back as estranged brothers rather than punish them as enemies. With that in mind then, he had a particular approach to how to restore the country. In his proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction, he wanted people in the South who had taken up arms against the United States of America to swear an oath of allegiance to the country. And if 10% of the uh, voting voters in that state were willing to swell, swear allegiance to the United States of America, then they could hold elections and restore their government with those um, people who swore allegiance participating in those elections. Three states, Louisiana and Tennessee and Arkansas, took advantage of this plan to reintegrate themselves into the United States of America. Now, as Lincoln went about this though, he was faced with an ideal embedded in our Constitution that many people thought the United States had not, excuse me, not embedded in our Constitution, I misspoke there, embedded in the Declaration of Independence, that many people thought that the United States had not yet lived up to, and they wanted it to live up to, and they saw this period of Reconstruction as an opportunity to force the country to live up to it. And that's that notion in the Declaration of Independence that we are all created equal, that we are all endowed with certain rights that can't be taken away from us, regardless of race. That was the big thing in the aftermath of the Civil War. Now, his Emancipation Proclamation took a step in that direction of declaring that slaves in any areas in rebellion against the United States would be freed. He had actually reluctantly done this. He had come to the conclusion that it was necessary to do to win the war. But remember, initially, Lincoln was not out to end slavery in the South. He just wanted to stop its spread into the West. But it was forced upon him by the war. He felt th this need to free the slaves. Now remember, as we taught in the last chapter, this Emancipation Proclamation did not free all the slaves. It only freed those slaves that were in areas that were in rebellion against the United States at that time. And this had practical consequences. There were a bunch of areas that were not currently in rebellion. They had already been conquered by the United States of America or had never rebelled in the first place. That meant that if you had slaves in Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, Tennessee, and areas of Louisiana and Virginia, well, regardless of the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the war, you could still keep your slaves. So obviously something more had to be done. This then led to the passage of the 13th Amendment, which was passed by Congress and then ratified by states to be added to the Constitution, which declared that slavery would no longer exist within the United States of America. Importantly, that amendment which was added to the Constitution granted Congress power to enforce it. Now, the reason that's important is they're going to use that power later on during Reconstruction. The opportunity for them to use that power came because of Lincoln's assassination. A Southerner named John Wilkes Booth, who was uh, very upset by the South losing the war, snuck into a movie theater and shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. He died not long thereafter. 
With the death of Lincoln, Lincoln's Reconstruction was then left to Andrew Johnson. Now remember, Andrew Johnson was the Democrat that was put on the ticket with Lincoln to try to provide a uniting ticket for the country to vote for in the 1864 election. Andrew Johnson was not nearly the skilled politician that Lincoln was. And his efforts to continue Lincoln's generous sort of reconstruction, where he, I, as I said earlier, he would look at the South as wayward brothers who have come home, would be very difficult for Andrew Johnson to pull off. The ratification of the 13th Amendment was achieved in a fairly short period of time. You can see the states on this map that were willing to do so immediately before its ratification in 1865. They're colored in blue. Other ones ratified it after it had been certified in the years that followed, but shortly thereafter. There were a few of the reluctant states that didn't ratify it for many years to come, like New Jersey and Florida, but it didn't matter because enough states had ratified it already. Now, I'm showing you this because there wasn't a lot of controversy about this. Um, the, the people in the South who were able to participate in politics at this point um, accepted the idea that slavery was over as a consequence of the war and putting it in the Constitution, oh well. Other things that are attempted to be done are a lot more controversial as they come up and I'll show that in a few moments. Well, after Lincoln died, Andrew Johnson tried to continue his more generous practices toward the South. One of the things he did was he pardoned, gave a presidential pardon, as he is empowered by the Constitution to do, to all those who had took up arms against the United States of America, who had less than $20,000 in property. This essentially forced the rich people in the South to petition him personally to be pardoned so that they couldn't be prosecuted for crimes against the United States. While Johnson was pardoning the Southerners, they got involved in politics again, and they instituted a series of laws that became known as Black Codes. Black Codes were laws that were designed to treat Blacks differently than whites in the South. Because of the 13th Amendment, they could no longer be slaves, but it doesn't mean that they were necessarily treated the same as whites. Some examples of Black Codes, and we'll talk about these more later on, were um, that black people, for example, had to be employed. Now think about what this means. You're a slave, you're suddenly made free, and then a law is passed that says you have to have a job. Well, where are you gonna go get a job? What skills do you have? What training? Basically, you just have to go to work on a plantation like you would, would before. But now rather than being a slave, you're gonna be an employee. What will you be paid to be an employee? Well, you'll get the same food you ate as a slave. You'll get the same um, shack to live in as a slave. You'll get the same clothes to wear as a slave. Uh, I should say that you did as a slave. Those will be your wages for now working as a free man. So these black codes were designed to essentially put blacks back in the condition of slavery without actually being slaves. Well, Johnson was trying to continue Lincoln's very generous conditions for reuniting with the South. But there were other people in Congress called radical Republicans that had a different idea. These radical Republicans in the Congress wanted to punish the South. They wanted to reform the South. They wanted to try to end all vestiges of slavery in the South. And they were going to use their powers, included those granted by the 13th Amendment, for Congress to enforce the ending of slavery in the South to do this. Another tool that they used was in the Constitution, it says that each House of Congress will judge the elections and the qualifications of its own members. So what this means is that the radical Republicans who had a majority in Congress could simply refuse to seat anybody in Congress who disagreed with them. So as the Southern states started trying to reelect people to go meet in Congress after the war was over, the radical Republicans just didn't accept them. They said, no, you can't meet with us, which meant that of the ones that were there, they had an absolute supermajority to do whatever they wanted because they wouldn't let anybody else come in to be part of the meeting with them. 
They wouldn't let anybody else be represented in Congress unless the state did what they wanted first in order to be able to elect those people. So one of the things that the radical Republicans then did with this absolute power in Congress is they passed a law called the Civil Rights Act of 1866, in which they required that every person it will shall have the same rights within the states and territories of the United States to eat, get the same benefit of the laws as though they were white. This was essentially outlining the black codes that have been passed. Johnson saw this as too much of a radical change for the South, and he vetoed the Civil Rights Act. Now, I said that the radical Republicans had a supermajority in Congress, so they overrode his veto and made the law um, a law anyway. But they were concerned that the courts might declare it unconstitutional, that they were reaching too far beyond their powers. So they proposed that an amendment be added to the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, that would make all persons born in the United States, including slave, former slaves now at this point, citizens of the United States, and it would guarantee that every state where they lived, including in the South, would have to treat them equally. This is using the Constitution to outlaw those black codes that treated the former slaves different than the white majority. But this proposed 14th Amendment was deeply offensive to some people in the South. Even some people who were in favor of treating slaves, slaves better saw it as an overreach of national power, that states should be, able to let, should be allowed to decide more, for more things for themselves. The southern states were particularly concerned that this was a way to enable blacks to vote. This bothered them for two reasons. One, they just thought that blacks weren't capable of casting of, um, reasonable votes. They had been raised in slavery. They were not educated. They thought that they weren't as intelligent, that sort of thing. So that's one problem they had. Another problem they had was the practical reality that in some places, blacks outnumbered whites. And they were afraid that the blacks would then take power and use the power to get revenge upon the white population. So what happened was Congress found a way to force the states to approve this amendment. See, when an amendment is proposed, it's proposed by Congress and then it's sent to the states to be ratified by them. I guess I should have explained that when we were talking about the 13th Amendment, but I didn't. You have to get three-fourths of the states to ratify an amendment. Well, now, wait a minute. More than one quarter of the states are these southern states that were in, were in rebellion during the Civil War. How are you gonna get them to agree with this? They've just been passing black codes to essentially put the now no longer slave population back into the condition of slavery. There's no way they're gonna go along with this. There's no way you're gonna get enough votes to actually add this to the Constitution. So what Congress did was they passed this law, the first Reconstruction Act. And what they said was that the state governments are dissolved. You think you've created governments in the aftermath of the Civil War, but you're not going to. We are only going to let you have your own state governments and have representation in Congress to actually elect people who we'll seat in Congress if you approve the 14th Amendment. They are essentially trying to coerce them into approving the 14th Amendment, and they go even farther. They divide the South up into military districts, each with an army encamped there and generals in charge in place of their state governments. And they tell them that the military is gonna remain in charge here, running your lives for you, unless you give in and you approve the 14th Amendment. Well, while, excuse me, while the military is in charge of the South in these military districts, they impose black suffrage. In other words, they let the newly freed slaves vote in local elections, state elections, whatever. As a result of that, for the first time in American history, several blacks are elected to Congress, to the House of Representatives, and even a couple of them to the United States Senate. Now, they actually don't end up staying there for long for some reasons that I'll talk about in a few moments, but 
this was a historic thing that happened and the reason was was because the US military that was occupying the South was preventing the former members of the Confederacy, the white people that had taken up arms against the United States of America from voting, and they were allowing the newly freed blacks to vote. And so, of course, they were electing blacks to Congress. And then the, the radical Republicans in Congress were willing to seat these people in Congress. At the same time that the military was occupying the South and limiting what the former Confederates were allowed to do, a bunch of Northerners moved to the South to take advantage of the situation. So you might have a town where nobody's eligible to be the mayor because, well, I should say no white person is eligible to be the mayor because they all fought in the Confederacy against the United States and the military that's occupying there isn't gonna allow them to vote. At the same time, the blacks in the town are probably uneducated, illiterate. They have no idea who to choose. And if they choose, chose someone, that person would not be capable of being mayor. They don't even know how to read and write. So how are you gonna have a mayor for that town? Well, what you do is you have somebody from Massachusetts move down there. They take up residence in the town. They say, hey, I'm from Massachusetts. I never fought against the Confederacy. I mean, fought with the Confederacy. So I'm eligible to be mayor. So vote for me. And they would go around, they would get the black voters to vote for them, and they would become the mayor. These people who came down and took advantage of the opportunity, northerners, to come and get power in the south, because southerners were not allowed to have power, were, call, were called carpetbaggers. Now, in some cases, some southerners were willing to give in. They were willing to swear allegiance and go along with the northern occupiers to get themselves ahead. They were called scalawags. They were collaborators with the enemy in the eyes of many people in the South. So the radical Republicans create this new agenda over the veto of Andrew Johnson. They are going to hammer the South into submission and make them behave the way that they think they should now after the war has been lost. But Andrew Johnson is an obstacle to that. He tries to veto, to stop their more radical measures. So they decide to impeach him. In other words, to accuse him of crime severe enough that he should be kicked out of office. They hold a trial to impeach him and he barely survives the trial. But he, he is in a, an incredibly weakened position and they are able to move forward without him. And one of the things that happens is they force through the 14th Amendment. They convince enough states to go along with it to get it ratified, and eventually even the southern states, years later, some cases many years later, finally ratify it so that they can finally be restored to full membership within the United States of America, rather than being occupied by a military force that's forcing them to obey. Well, eventually Andrew Johnson's term ends in office and we have another presidential election. And the Republicans decide to nominate the hero of the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant, as their nominee for president. And he wins easily over Horatio Seymour, the Democratic nominee. Not only does he win most of the free states, but he wins many of the southern states. Now, why? Because, again, as I said, there's military occupation and they are not going to allow these people to participate who are opposing what the radical Republicans in Congress want. So you have people generally in the South that are going along with the Reconstruction agenda or they're not allowed to vote. Among these are the newly freed slaves. As I explained earlier, they are being allowed to vote by the military occupiers. Well, as you saw on the previous map, most of the southern states gave in and ratified the 14th Amendment so they could get rid of the troops and go back to running their own states, but not all of them. By 1869, there were still four states that had not been reconstructed. And what do I mean by that is they had not accepted the 13th and 14th Amendment as valid and had the military occupation ended so they could take over their own politics again. 
One of those was Georgia, which did ratify the 14th Amendment and was accepted, but then immediately after tried to pass a bunch of black code kind of laws anyway, and Congress rescinded its reconstruction and would no longer seat members from Georgia into Congress until they behaved better. So then what happened was Congress proposed the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment, which would make the voting of blacks in the South permanent. And one of the ways they got the 15th Amendment passed by, was by coercing these remaining states. Specifically, they told Georgia that Georgia would not be admitted back into Congress until Georgia had approved the 15th Amendment. Well, eventually enough states gave in. The 15th Amendment was also ratified, and it said that the right to vote cannot be denied to anyone on the basis of race. This then allowed the free blacks in the South that had been former slaves but now freed to participate in their local elections. We can see that the 15th Amendment, unlike the 14th Amendment, was ratified a little more easily. The reason is, is because most of these states had already accepted the 14th Amendment. They already knew that they had lost this political battle. The only question was, will they be allowed to fully participate or not? And so they kind of quickly gave in and accepted it. Ulysses S. Grant then ran for re-election in 1872 and again easily won. His opponent, Horace Greeley, um, wasn't even a Democrat. The Democratic Party was in such disarray. He was a splinter off of the Republican Party, who actually died between um, the election and the meeting of the Electoral College. So it's kind of one of those odd things in history. You don't need to remember that for an exam. But Ulysses S. Grant was reelected. So the Republicans have clear, absolute control of the government, and they're using it to force the South to reform itself into what the radical Republicans want to do. Now, much of this is being done in the service of giving black Americans the kind of freedoms that white Americans had. But it wasn't as easy as just passing these amendments and saying that they had freedom. A lot of freedom comes from economics. In other words, if you don't have the economic ability to do things, then you're not free to do them. It doesn't do you much good that you're no longer a slave if you just have to go take a job on the same plantation where you're a slave doing the same work that you did as a slave. Well, in the immediate aftermath of the war, a way was proposed to try to deal with this. Um, General Sherman, the guy who famously marched to the sea and burned Georgia uh, as, as he was on his march, offered to free, free to, to slaves that he freed that they would eventually get 40 acres and a mule to start a new life. And he tried to actually make some of that happen as a general, but he didn't really have the power to do it in a widespread way. But that was an ideal that these newly freed slaves, uh, former slaves, excuse me, would be given the means to build their own lives. They'd be given land and some um, uh, resources to try to uh, work the land so that they could have their own economic independence. Well, an actual government agency was set up to get this going. It was called the Freedman's Bureau. And the idea behind the Freedman's Bureau originally was that they would redistribute the land that had been confiscated from the Confederates who had fought against the United States. They would redistribute it to the newly freed blacks, but it didn't happen. The tide was turning in a sense already against some of these radical ideas. One of the things that happened was while Andrew Johnson was still president, he ordered that the Confederate lands that had been confiscated by the United States Army be reinstated to those who they had been confiscated from. So now think about this. The idea was that those lands would be redistributed to the former slaves because the army had confiscated them. But now Andrew Johnson, as the president of the United States, who's the commander in chief of the military, gives them back to all those big plantation owners. Now you don't have the land to give to the former slaves. So what happens is the Freedmen's Bureau has to turn around and tell them, sorry, 
you've got to return to your old jobs on the plantations. And that's what happened for most of the former slaves. While they were officially free, their day-to-day -day economic life had not changed. This left them in poverty, but they were not the only ones left in poverty. The white South was left in poverty too. Remember that they had been annihilated in the war. Their land torn up, tore up and burned. Their men killed and maimed. There, they were on severe economic handicaps after the war. Poverty continued through the South for decades, maybe a century afterwards, as a result of the harsh reality of this war. Many of the newly free blacks had to turn to the practice of sharecropping just to get enough to eat. What would happen is the owners of these big plots of land, these plantations, said, okay, I, I don't have slavery anymore, so I can't use the same coercive tactics on these black workers that I did previously. So I've got to figure out some other way to force them to work the land for me in an efficient way. So here's what I'll do is I will assign each of them a chunk of land and I'll say, okay, I need you to raise this crop on this land. It's my land. And uh, you give me a certain percentage of it and ooh, the rest you can keep. This was similar to the feudal system that existed in Europe that we talked about in this course way back at the beginning. We were talking about why people left Europe to come to America for the freedoms here. It was a way to squeeze as much work as possible out of the newly freed um, former slaves because they knew if they worked harder, they would get to keep more, but they would also have to give more to the owner of the land. Matter of fact, they may have to give a certain amount or they would get kicked off the land. So this became a standard practice and it was a way to sort of alleviate some of the responsibilities of the owner of the land too. I mean, he doesn't have to feed and clothe you if you don't produce. You're free. You can go do your own thing then. There were also black codes that were reinstituted in this time period. Now, many of them were done away with by the 14th Amendment, but not all of them. And there was that time period in between the, the end of the war and the 14th Amendment coming along and saying that you could no longer have black codes. One of the things that was done to force the, the newly freed slaves back into the same working conditions they were do, doing before was to arrest them for whatever petty crimes were um, outlawed in that area. Like, for example, the one I used before is that you have to be employed. They find you not employed, they arrest you. And then what they do is they lease you out to somebody to work while you're serving your sentence. So think about how this might work. You're a man working on a particular plantation as a slave. Then the war comes and you are freed, but you don't have any skills to do anything else really. And then they pass this black code saying that you have to be employed. Well, you either go back and work that job on that plantation or you don't. Now, if you don't, you're then unemployed and they come along and arrest you. They say, you're a criminal, we've arrested you. You are now within our custody and guess what we're gonna do? We are going to hire you out to that same person, that same plantation that you were on before to do the same work you did before. And you're gonna do that until you've earned enough money to pay your fine. This was a way to force the uh, newly freed um, blacks, former slaves, back into their same working conditions before. So the point of all that was that while they were freed from slavery, they still had a long fight to go to get, a, to get true freedom and equality. Well, the American Anti-Slavery Society, which had been in place just to end slavery, in a sense had accomplished its purpose. Would it continue? Well, there was another society, the National Women's Rights Convention, that was trying to get more rights for women. They ended up merging together in the aftermath of the war as the American Equal Rights Association. Now it isn't just about ending slavery or about getting equal rights for women. It's about trying to get equal rights to all people. Okay, theoretically this, this works, but in practice it didn't. See, the leaders of the women's movement were particularly concerned about suffrage. They knew that women are actually a majority of the population. 
if women can just be allowed to vote, they can actually outvote the men and get whatever women want. So they were focused on let's get women the right to vote and then all other things will follow after that. But remember, in the aftermath of the war, there were um, passages added to the Constitution to specifically help the former slaves. The 13th Amendment that ended slavery, the 14th Amendment that uh, uh, required that they be treated equally, the 15th Amendment that granted the right to vote. None of those were about women. So the leaders of the women's suffrage movement, such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, actually opposed that series of amendments. Why would they oppose them? Well, I'll get to that in just a moment, but they were so opposed that they actually allied the women's movement with the white supremacists who didn't want the amendments passed either because they still wanted to keep oppressing black people. Why? Well, let's look at the actual amendment, 14. The 14th amendment says that, for example, when the right to vote is denied to any of the male inhabitants of a state, then certain things are going to happen. Whoa! Notice it says male inhabitants. Well, the women's rights people wanted that male part struck out. They wanted the 14th Amendment to give women the opportunity to vote too, but it didn't. That's why they opposed it. And how about the 15th Amendment? It says the right to vote will not be denied or abridged on account of race. All right, so you can't stop black men from voting, but you can stop black women because you're stopping them because of their, their sex rather than their race. You can stop white women too, you can stop women. Again, they opposed the amendment because it didn't protect women, it only protected blacks. And they, in an effort to stop the amendment from being passed, actually tried to get women to side with the anti-black racists to defend, to defeat these amendments, but they failed. Well, there were other women during this time period with a different agenda. They were the women of the South who had seen their husbands, their fathers, their sons defeated in war. And they felt a need to restore Southern masculine pride, to help their men feel good about being men over the households as they had once been. So they created these memorial associations where they raised statues all over the South to honor their men and their, their leaders who had fought in the war, in the war. These are the very statues that as of 2020 were being torn down. The reason they went up was because these women in the South felt like they needed to restore some pride to their men who had been defeated so that they could be leaders again within their homes and their communities. Now, that idea of putting up statues for people, while it may seem, be seen as a, a bad thing in our modern point of view, was a fairly innocuous thing, okay? It's just a statue. Much more troublesome for the newly freed blacks at this time were groups that were known as night riders and bushwhackers who went around, they were vigilantes, who tried to enforce norms of behavior that they thought blacks were violating. They would try to frighten them or even kill them to keep them out of certain occupations, certain offices, or from voting, for example. It was a matter of constant harassment behind the scenes, outside the law, to try to get them to conform. So from the point of view of these night Riders and Bushwhackers, because of the 14th and 15th Amendment, they may not be able to officially, legally treat blacks as different and deny them the right to vote, but they can scare them into not exercising those rights. The most well-known example of these kind of organizations is the Ku Klux Klan, which was started in a little town in Tennessee and within a few years had spread throughout the South. It was an organization shrouded in mystery and ritual that was built around uh, a Cranian institution that could enforce white rule throughout the South and intimidate anybody that might challenge it. Well, the radical Republicans that ran the United States Congress decided that they needed to do something about the Knight Riders and Bushwhackers and Ku Klux Klan men that were trying to intimidate blacks in the South. So they passed the Enforcement Acts, a series of laws that made it a federal crime 
to engage in these intimidating tactics and specifically empowered the United States military to provide protection for the blacks and to enforce these, these constitutional amendments and their provisions. Now, this was, again, part of the radical Republican agenda to force the South to conform. So they forced, first of all, the South to conform legally by passing these amendments, and then they forced them to conform culturally by having military occupation and the passage of laws like this. Well, eventually, this, this forced reconstruction of the South would come to an end. It would come to an end as a new political movement um, came to force in the South. These were Democrats. Now, remember, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. The, the people behind the radical agenda in Congress are Republicans. They are the people that have ended the way of life of the South. So the Republican Party is seen as the enemy. So if you're a white Southerner wanting to restore the traditional way of life in the South, you're not going to be a Republican. You're going to be a Democrat. The Democratic Party was the party of the hardcore racists who, if they could get away with continuing slavery, would have, but they couldn't. So they were going to do these other things like black codes and the Ku Klux Klan and intimidation and things like that. They called themselves redeemers. And what they meant by that is they wanted to eventually get hold, get control of their state governments and restore things back as much as they could be restored to the way things were before the Civil War. Now notice the key to that is getting control of their own governments. This is known as home rule. Restoring it to the state, restoring it to the counties, restoring it to the communities. Let them make their own rules, their own laws, rather than being imposed by the radical Republicans in Washington, D.C. Now one of the ways they try to persuade people to give them that control back is by downplaying their agenda. They tried to say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to oppress the black people. Anybody who says that is a liar and an exaggerator. They are waving the bloody shirt is the phrase that was used. And this was a reference to a member of Congress who actually waved around a bloody shirt that he claimed had blood on it by somebody who was hurt by some of these people in an attack. Anyway, and they said, oh, no, no, it's just a prop. It's a prop to exaggerate your emotions. We don't plan to do anything like that. Now, looking back, we can see that that was not true. Now, whether they knew it was not true and were just lying about it, that's open to debate. But clearly, they were going to come in and oppress blacks if they could get control. But they were trying to downplay that. So in the 1876 election, after Ulysses S. Grant has served two terms in office, the country has stabilized in a sense. The, the southern states have been readmitted to the Union. The, the, the southerners, most of the whites have been pardoned for their part in the Civil War and they can vote. And the question is, will we have another Republican president, Rutherford behaves, or will we actually have a Democrat elected president, Samuel J. Tilden? Samuel J. Tilden tried to come across as a reasonable Democrat. No, no, no. We just want to restore home rule in the South so these people can govern their own lives again. We are not going to oppress the blacks. Don't worry. And this appealed to enough people in the country that not only did he win many places in the South, but he won elsewhere too. The election was so close that in the aftermath, both candidates declared themselves to be the winners. We can look at the map of how the Electoral College actually ended up shaking out. And the real question came down to three southern states, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina. The question was, had they voted for Rutherford B. Hayes or had they voted for Samuel J. Tilden? Now, Southerners insisted there's no way they voted for Rutherford B. Hayes, that there had to be election fraud in, for, in order for him to win in the South. The rest of the South voted for the Democrats. We all know the South is going to vote Democrat if the majority whites actually allowed to vote. So the only way they could have lost, he could have lost in these states was that there are election shenanigans. On the other hand, the Republicans claimed, no, no, no. The, the elections were run fairly. There were still people that weren't eligible to vote in these states. These states were more um, uh, enabling of blacks to vote, which swung the states in their way. I mean, half the population of South Carolina at this time period was black. And so this was a legitimate result. It was a close result, but it was a legitimate result that Rutherford B. Hayes won. Well, both sides were insisting that they were the real winners of the election. 
And the way to resolve it, they decided was to have an electoral commission go through and analyze all the facts and figure out who the real winner was. The problem was is this electoral commission was uh, composed of partisans. It had eight Republicans, seven Democrats, and when it came time to vote at the end who actually won the election, they voted for the member of their own party. And so Rutherford B. Hayes had seemed to narrowly win the Electoral College, but the Democrats claim fraud, and then he narrowly wins the Electoral Commission, and they say, oh, they didn't even look at the facts, it's just all politics. So what happens is the South starts agitating that there may be another civil war over this, and the North does not want that. They, they won the first war, they've managed to impose the three Civil War amendments, they've done enough, they feel like. They're, it isn't worth another fight. And so a compromise is reached. In exchange for Samuel Tilden withdrawing his candidacy and giving the victory to the Republican, federal troops are withdrawn from the South. Now, the reason that's so important is they were the ones that were stopping the white majority from oppressing the blacks in any way that they wanted to. So immediately after the southern, the, the federal troops are withdrawn from the south, intimidation begins now openly. You, you don't need secret bushwhackers in the night doing it. You don't need hooded Ku Klux Klan men. It can be out in the open now. They stop the blacks from voting. And if they don't do it by openly intimidating them with guns, like in this picture, they find more subtle ways to stop black voting. Such as passing a series of laws that would make it more difficult for blacks to vote. They pass laws requiring people to pass a literacy test to prove that they can read and write before they vote. Well, now, wait a minute. Most of these people, had previous, the, the black voters, had previously been slaves and it was illegal for them to learn how to read and write. So, of course, they can't pass the literacy test. They also instituted um, poll taxes. This meant that you had to pay a fee to vote. Well, the potential black voters are all quite poor. I mean, they're former slaves. They can't pay the tax. But wait a minute. You have poor white people, too. You also have white people in much of the South who can't read or write. What about them? Well, these laws might include what are called grandfather clauses that say that if your grandfather could vote, then you're allowed to vote whether you can pay the poll tax or literacy test or not. Well, now, wait a minute. The grandfather of the potential black voter had been a slave. Of course, he didn't vote. While the grandfather of the poor, illiterate white guy, oh, yeah, he could vote. So I get to vote then without having to pay the poll tax or take the literacy tests. These were clever ways to um, limit black voting while still allowing white voting. And they were justified by justifications that in some way seem reasonable. That, hey, you shouldn't be allowed to vote unless you can actually read and write and know what's going on. You shouldn't be allowed to vote unless you're willing to donate a little bit to society by paying a tax, that kind of thing. So they had these reasons that seemed to be neutral, but were in fact not. They were designed to restrict one run race for the benefit of the other. Well, through these kind of measures, they were able to limit black participation in politics. They were able to restore white participation in politics throughout the South. And the whites, um, who were still deeply racist at this time, were able to take completely over. And while they couldn't return the free black population to slavery, they could impose absolute white rule over them. And that's what happened as a result of the Compromise of 1877, was a return of supreme white rule in the South. And that does it for the material in Chapter 15.